we want to talk about Laodicea, the compromising church. So if Shannon could dim the lights a bit in the sanctuary. <clears throat> this is the last of our series on the seven churches as Pastor Watts just informed us. This church has also be called, been called the lukewarm church. And we're going to see why Jesus calls it a lukewarm, a tepid church, half worldly, half Christian. Now, we read about Laodicea not only in the book of Revelation, but in the book of Colossians. If you read with me Colossians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, it says, Epaphra, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. According to tradition, it was this Epaphra who um, opened the work in Laodicea. And he was a co-laborer with Paul. Now, Verse 13 says, For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and in them in Hierapolis. And this Hierapolis was a city close to Laodicea. Very close to Laodicea. Luke, the beloved physician, we continue reading in Colossians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea. See, these were close churches, so Paul had written to Colossia, but he's greeting the people in Laodicea. Nymphas and the church which is in his house. Apparently Epaphra went, he shared the gospel, Nympha accepted the gospel, and... A church started in his home. It's a symbol that during this church period there would be many home churches, house churches. I can think about when we came to Tampa, we started in a house church at my mother's house. Colossians 4.16 And when this epistle is read among you in Colossia, Cause that it be read also in the church of Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle of Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Archippus, according to tradition, was the first bishop of the church in Laodicea. He doesn't seem to have been a very good bishop, a very good pastor. Because look what the Lord tells him through Paul. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Apparently, <coughs> he was busy doing other things. Maybe in business. Maybe in commerce. Or maybe doing nothing at all and just getting a paycheck. And Paul said, take heed to the ministry. Do your work that you have received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Well, let's compare Laodicea to Hierapolis. It's sister city. So there's three cities that we're talking about, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossia. This is the gate to Ephesus that is found in Laodicea. But a few miles away is Hierapolis. Look at the difference, how it's conserved how it's been preserved, the entrance to the city of Hierapolis. Look at the amphitheater in Laodicea, in that condition it is found. But when you go to Hierapolis, look how beautiful and preserved it is from the Roman time. This is the walkway in Laodicea, as it remains in ruins. But in Hierapolis... Look at the wonderful preserved highway to Ephesus. 
The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Let's consider these characteristics. Amen? It's because it's the end. This is the last church. The faithful and true witness. Well, we believe that when it talks about a faithful and true witness, it's talking about a judgment. And this church period starts in 1844 when we believe Jesus moved in the heavenly sanctuary from the holy to the most holy to intercede and to do the judgment of the dead. Eventually he will get to the judgment of the living. And then he will come dressed in red, the Bible says, with all the hosts of heaven. So this period is from 1844 to the end. To the second coming of Christ. Laos in Greek means people. And Decia means judgment or righteousness. So when you're judged, you're condemned. Or you can be made righteous through Christ. And as Christ is doing this judgment in heaven, it is a time period in when God's people will be judged here on earth according to human law, according to the law of the man of sin, according to the Sunday law. And they have to remain faithful and a true witness of Christ and of his Sabbath. Because this, in this church period, Jesus emphasizes creation. It's because in this time that evolution was promoted and upheld, even among Adventists, and Marxism is within this time period. Now, there's something else we need to highlight. It was at Laodicea that a synod was held in 364. And this was the resolution that they came to. Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. So this is the first church law in favor of Sunday that we find registered. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out of Christ. The keeping of the Sabbath in the eyes of many is only to be kept by Jews. But God gave the law at Mount Sinai that did not belong to Israel. It belonged to Arabia because it was given for the world. And it highlights that it is during the Laodicean period that Sunday law will return and similar laws will be issued. William Ramsey, who was an archaeologist, that lived in the late 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s, and he visited Laodicea. This is what he said. In the letter itself, those are the qualities, faithfulness and truth, which Laodicea is lacking. The Laodicean church is neither one thing nor the other. It's not faithful and it's not true. It is given to compromise. It cannot thoroughly reject the temptations and the allurements of the world. We're remembered by our kippas that he had to be reminded he needed to come to the ministry. And therefore it shall be rejected absolutely and exonerably by him whose faithfulness and truth reject all half-hearted service and compromise. Now witness is the same word as testimony. The Greek word is martus. That's where we get our word martyr. So... Here in this church period, Christ is saying there are going to be martyrs. We had martyrs in World War I. We had martyrs in World War II. <coughs> and there will be martyrs during the Sunday law. And the punishment will be to be decapitated, beheaded, the guillotine. We read in Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and the souls of them 
that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, or the testimony of Jesus, for the spirit of prophecy, and for the word of God, for the Bible, for Jesus. Who are they? Those that did not worship the beast, neither his image. That is still in the future. We don't have the image of the beast yet. Neither had received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. We don't have the mark of the beast yet. So Jesus is foretelling that is, that's going to be the trial for God's people in this time. Now look at this map. You see Laodicea, Hierapolis to the north, Colossia to the south, and here's this river, the Lycus River, that goes through Colossia <coughs> and comes close to Laodicea. So Laodicea was called Laodicea on the Lycus in Phrygia. Lycus means the wolf. That's the name of the river, the wolf. And we're reminded of the words of Jesus, of those who come in wolf's clothing. What did Jesus say? Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. False prophets. Now, in the book of Revelation, we read of the false prophet who does miracles before the beast and deceives them that receive the mark of the beast and then that worship his image. The false prophet, I believe, refers to nominal Protestantism and its charismatic movement with its miracles that try to bring evidence that a rapture is going to come, that the Antichrist is still in the future, that when you die, you immediately go to heaven that there's going to be a thousand years of peace on earth. The wolf, that was the name of the river that came close to Laodicea. Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. Charles Dickens, I believe, was the one who wrote the book, uh, The Tale of Two Cities. Well, this is the tale of three cities. Now notice... The beauty, when we look at the geography and the words of Christ, and we see the parallel. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you. Colossae had a river that was very cold, and it was south of Laodicea. Very cold river. Its waters are cold, even if you go today. There you're seeing Colossae, how it stands today. And here you're looking at the stream, the cold stream. It'll wake you up. But there's another city that was very different from cold Colossae, and that was hot Hierapolis. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Well, this is the entryway to Hierapolis. And they have hot springs, hot boiling springs. And the beauty of these springs is that they contain a lot of calcium carbonate. So when these springs come out from the middle of the earth, it leaves, it covers the hillside all in white like symbolizing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That word, hot, is very similar to zeal. Zestus is the Greek word for hot. Zealous, we say in English. When you are hot in Christ, you are zealous for Christ, and he will cover you with his righteousness. When you stood at Laodicea and you looked towards Hierapolis, you could see <coughs> this Beautiful plateau, all covered in white, and you can go there today, and it is still like that. Look at this. Look how white, it, as if it was covered in snow, and it's all calcium carbonate, and here are the pools of hot water. People come, and they take off their shoes, and they walk in this hot springs. 
But what about Laodicea, the compromising church? So then, because thou art lukewarm, it wasn't cold, it wasn't hot, it was just the mixture, it was lukewarm. Neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, what they did was, they collected the waters from Hierapolis, and they had this aqueduct that you're still looking at, the remnants of it, in Laodicea, and they transported the water inside this aqueduct. <coughs> You can see how the water would run through here. There's the aqueduct. And then through it, you had the water running through. And you can still see how white it was from all that calcium carbonate that was coming through. But as it went through the miles down to Laodicea, it became lukewarm. And there was one thing that Laodicea lacked, and that was its own source of water. It was very well fortified, but it did not have a source of water, which is a symbol of the Spirit of God. It says that we, when we believe in Jesus, out of our soul will spring out waters, rivers of water, referring to the Spirit of God. So down south, it, there was a cold stream in Colossae, but in Laodicea, it was lukewarm and caused people to spit it out. Now, the only animal I know, there may be others, that we keep around in our homes are dogs. You know when dogs... Vomit, they eat their vomit. They'll vomit and then they'll eat it back up. And the Bible says there's going to be no dogs in the New Jerusalem. No dogs. God doesn't want us to eat up what we cast out of worldliness. And he says he will spit them out. All Laodiceans that have been benefited so much, but have not changed their characters. Revelation 3.17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, increase in goods, and I have need of nothing. <coughs> and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You know in that song, Amazing Grace, you have that word wretched. O wretched man that I am, Paul says, who shall save me from this body of death? Well, Laodicea was known as a great banking center of antiquity. We read in history that they were able to coin, mint their own coins. They had so much money, so much silver. <coughs> and even Cicero, the great philosopher, Roman philosopher, lived in Laodicea. It was a city of great knowledge, of great knowing, and a banking center and William Ramsey says in his letters to the seven churches, Cicero brought with him in 51 BC orders to be cashed in Laodicea as a city of banking and exchange. He had letters that said, you have to give me money because they're signed. Signed by government officials and the Laodiceans paid. They had so much money that when an earthquake hit Laodicea and the emperor offered to help them reconstruct, they said no. We don't need your help. We have enough money to rebuild our city. It was a city with many Jews that were, many, that were rich. Like in William Shakespeare, the merchant of Venice, there's this banker who is Jewish and he has money. And so there were many Jews there. At one time they confiscated 20... Um, I believe it was 20 talents of gold or so. And 20 pounds I have here. 20 pounds of gold, which was the equivalent of 15,000 silver drachmae. And the temple tax was half a shekel. So if you take one half of 15,000, Sister Austria, what is the result? 7,500, so there were at least 7,500 male Jews because every male Jew has to pay 
a temple tax of half a shekel per year. So in 62 BC, the, em- the governor, Flaccus, that was his name, he confiscated those 20 pounds of gold that was the equivalent of 15,000 silver drachmae, which was the equivalent of 7,500 shekels. No, half. The te- that 15, okay, then you, you half it. 15,000 silver drachmae is the equivalent... Of 30,000 people. No, of 7,500. So it's two to one. 7,500 Jews. So apparently um, half a shekel equaled one drachmae. Now, Laodicea was also famous for its black sheep. Black sheep. And they made a certain type of robe, a tunic, that was considered a trimita, to the point that it sold so well that some people called Laodicea the city of Timitaria, Timitaria, according to William Ramsey. It was a great manufacturing center of this black wool. It was soft. It was glossy. It was also a medical center. In the pagan temple, people would come to find cures. And their doctors were so famous that they were even minted on coins. You're looking at a coin from Laodicea from 15 BC. And Zextus Philalitis was one of the two famous doctors. The other is Alexander, who was found. And it made me think about, well, in Adventism, we've had very, two very famous physicians. One was Kellogg, and the other today, Ben Carson. <clears throat> But it represents, like Loma Linda, that has been a very renowned institution for medical education. But the reality is that we are wrecked, wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. And yet we don't realize that that is the sadness of it. The facts, Laodicea is the only church that receives no con commendation from Jesus, no praise from Jesus. All this church gets is rebuke. Many believe that this church represents the modern-day Western church, not just the Adventist church or Adventists, but all Christians that feel that they are rich and have need of nothing. Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire that thou mayest be rich in white raiment. Notice the white raiment. They made black raiment. Jesus says, you need to be covered in white raiment. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve. Now that's a poor translation. It shouldn't be eye salve. It should be collyrium. And I'm going to show you a picture of what the collyrium looks like. It was found by investigators from a ship that sank in the Mediterranean. The collyrium, they were able to find it. It was preserved after 2,000 years. That thou, that thou mayest see. These are some of the coins. They had not only silver coins, they had gold coins in Laodicea. It was a rich city. And Jesus says to buy of me gold, gold, which is the symbol of faith and love. What overcomes the world but our faith? Three things remain, hope, faith, and love, but the greatest of all is love, the love of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't use the word agape. He uses the word filio, brotherly love. The black sheep. Jesus says, no, we need to be covered in white raiment, which is a symbol of his righteousness, which is a symbol of good works. The good works of Christ that we repeat are a symbol of righteousness. Well, here it is. Kyla, look. 
This is the Calyrium, the ancient Isalf. Calyrium literally means little pieces of bread rolled together. And you're looking at them in this little container. They would put them in a container, they were dried, and then it was transported. And in this tin can, you would open it and then mix it with water and then you would anoint the eyes. The composition has been found. It has a lot of zinc in it and it has carrots in it. So they knew that carrots were important for the eyes, to improve the eyes that were dissolved and mixed together. According to Strabo, there was a medical school in the city where a famous ophthalmologist and ophthalmologist practice. The city also lies within the boundaries of the ancient Phrygia, from where an ingredient, the eye lotions, the so-called Phrygian power, was supposed to have originated. Here you're looking at Strabo's um, geography, where he talks about the world in his day, 9 BC, so a few years before the birth of Christ. And so they would bring these, <coughs> this collyrium to anoint the eyes so that people could be cured from their disease. Maybe from pink eye, maybe from cataract, maybe from short-sightedness or far far-sightedness. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be hot and repent, Jesus says. And he says something else. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Isn't it shocking? that this is the only church in which Jesus is not outside. He has been cast out. He has been locked out. And he cannot open the door from the outside. There's a story in the book of the Song of Solomon where this prince is in love with this young girl. She is dark-skinned and she is in bed and this prince comes to the door and knocks and says, please open, I'm here. And she says, oh no, it's too late, I'm tired. I've already put on my sleeping clothes, my pajamas, I have them on. I don't want to get off my bed. And then she says, no, this is my prince. Maybe she's half dreaming. Like the virgins, they all fell asleep. And then she runs to the door to open. And the prince has left. He's no longer there. And then she goes out in the middle of the night and she's asking the watchman, have you seen my lover? And they say, no, we have not. There's a song in Spanish we sing, Si Cristo llega a tu puerta y toca, dile sí, sí, sí. If Jesus comes to your door and knocks, say, yes, 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 you may come in. No matter the situation you're in, don't say, wait a moment, let me do something. No, open the door because he may leave. And he comes to the door of our house. Sister White says in the book that compiles her writings, the Adventist Bible Commentary, under Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, this is the hope of reform. The hope of reform. The reform movement. 1914. Where God came knocking on the church doors. Saying to flee for your life. Because this city, this world, is going to end. May the Lord help us that we may open our hearts to Jesus. Accept Him into our lives. And although we live in the Laodiceans, period, may we not have the Laodicean compromising spirit. 
but ask Jesus to reform us, that we may repent in his name. It's my wish and prayer. Amen.